Hello friends. From now on, I'll talk to you about a very common disease that we see in our country and in Asia. And that is about Kyle Urea. Over the last three decades, I have evolved significant experience by treating these patients. And in this video, I shall be sharing with you what is the common perception about this disease and what is my perception about the disease and where things differ. So in the first video, I will talk to you about what is Kyluria and why does it happen? What is Kyluria? Normally a patient passes urine which is like this straw colored. But when patient comes and tells you that my urine has become milky, then we call this condition as chyluria. In chyluria, patients have various shades of milky white urine and that happens intermittently over the day and over the week. Some patients have, if this is the normal color of urine and this is typical chyluria, some patients have a mix of blood and this is called hematochyluria or chylohematuria. Why we got interested in this disease? First of all, this chyluria is a consequence of lymphatic filariasis that is rife in our country and we see all shades of the disease. So it was a huge burden for us to treat. And then the sufferers are our poor rural folks, mostly male adults. And to them, this disease will give a morbidity, which is not only urological morbidity, but also a nutritional morbidity and immunological morbidity in long term. So we had our reasons to be interested in this disease. And therefore, we looked into this with penetrating eyes. So talking to you first, why does it occur? There are two types as far as the etiology of the disease goes. There are two types. One is called parasitic or tropical chyluria, the one which happens in tropical countries. And other is a non-parasitic or a non-tropical chyluria, which happens in the western world. The parasitic type of chyluria that we see here, we consider this as mostly filarial in origin until proved otherwise. We do see some cases of tuberculosis in retroperitoneum causing this disease, but mostly it is filarial in origin. So parasitic or tropical, as I said, we consider this as a consequence of filariasis. So is it that the filaria is the only etiology in India or there is something else to play? I would submit to you that 95% of times the answer is yes, right? It is filarial in origin. But we suspect non-filarial if the age of the patient is less than 10 years because this would fit into category of some kind of congenital problem in lymphatic system and manifesting as chyluria. Or if the patient's age is more than 60 and patient is having chyluria for the first time, these patients have retroperitoneal disease, a metastatic retroperitoneal disease more likely uh, as a cause of initiating chyluria. If patient has history of tuberculosis in past, particularly abdominal tuberculosis or if the patient has very severe and very persistent type of chyluria not showing any response to conservative methods. So usually the block in lymphatic system is far more significant and etiology can be different. So friends, in India, those of you who are listening to me in India and treating filariasis, treating chyluria, 95% of times it is this non-filial entity should be considered in 
these three roots. Are there any other parasites? There are few parasites like Strongycus gigas, Tinea kinococcus, Tinea nana, malarial parasites, and Serenomonas hominis. These are rare parasites, and there are anecdotal cases reported in literature where these parasites give rise to chylaria, but I would think this is very, very rare, and direct causal relationship has not been proven in those cases reported in literature. So when we started seeing these patients, we had our own share of experience and we started challenging some of the concepts. The common concept was that chyluria is a manifestation of chronic filariasis. And it was said that patient must have had chyluria well 7 to 10 years earlier than the onset of chyluria. So it takes so much of time for chyluria to manifest. But then we saw in our patients in the urine a moving microfilial worm. So why should a patient of chyluria have a live microfilaria coming in his urine if it is a manifestation of chronic filariasis? Similarly, when we did a scrotal Doppler ultrasound of some of these patients, we found a live microfilarial worm dancing in the epididymis and this was called as the filarial dance. Why would a patient of chyluria have a live microfilaria in the epididymis? So we had these two questions in our mind and therefore we feel today that if I have to give you the answer for this question, I would say that in some patients we find eosinophilia and in some patients we find live, live microfilaria in blood and urine. So therefore, it is actually, there is a chronic retroperitoneal disease in form of uh, lymphangiectasia and over and above that chronic disease, there occurs another fresh acute attack of lymphatic filariasis, which causes acute enhancement of lymphatic flow in the retroperitoneum and therefore the chyluria manifests. So it is not only chronic filariasis manifesting late but it is acute and chronic in many patients. So the change concept is chyluria may also result following a fresh acute attack over pre-existing chronic retroperitoneal disease. The second category which is a non-parasitic, non-tropical which happens in the western world as I said. Often there are rare instances having congenital fistulous communication between the urinary tract and retroperitoneal lymphatic system or there may be an obstruction in the mediastinum or high in the retroperitoneum where there is a lymphatic obstruction in the thorax and in, and in the retroperitoneum resulting into lymphatic hypertension and then later on fistula formation between lymphatic system and urinary system. We have recently started experiencing one more kind of variety which is seen following a partial nephrectomy of a tumor particularly if the tumor is in the upper and the medial part like the one shown here. When this tumor is removed in that process you do dissection in this part of the area and disrupting some lymphatics and if there is an injury to the intestinal trunk then the chyle will leak and it will establish a communication with the renal lymphatics or renal raw parenchyma. This is called traumatic lymphangiourinary fistula and there is some incidence of this complication. When you do uh, a CT scan of these patients, you will notice that in their bladder, there is a supernatant black area which is sometimes mistaken as air in the bladder. But that is not air. It is a floating fat in the urine of the bladder which is coming up as a black shadow. If I were to explain you in little more detail, why does uh, the disease start and what actually goes wrong in terms of the pathogenesis, 
this is how the lymphatic system in the retroperitoneum is arranged. The lymphatic flow comes from the lower limbs and the pelvis in the lumbar trunks, right? This is the intestinal trunk, your right and left lumbar trunk, intestinal trunk here, and in this joins the renal. In some patients, the renal trunk is separate, and this will go to cisterna chylae and then it will go to thoracic duct. That's the way the limb flows from below to up. This is how the kidneys are arranged in the triperitoneum, ureter and bladder, a sketch diagram, and this is how the lymphatic system is arranged. This is the trunk from the lower limbs, this is intestinal trunk, and this is renal trunk. They move independently, independently to drain into the cisterna chylae. But when there is an obstruction here, the lymph flow into all these territory is retarded and there occurs lymphatic hypertension and lymphatics will become varicose as I have shown here by making them little bulbous. And then it may happen that following a bout of cough or following lifting heavy weight or following some jerky exercise, cycling, when abdominal pressure is very heavy, suddenly you will have a rupture of this lymphatic into the renal lymphatic. This is how. So the one lymphatic to another lymphatic or one more fistula communication into this to this and then these lymphatics become more varicose, they contain more lymph, they become little more dilated and varicose over the period of time and then one fine day these blobby vesicles of dilated lymph vessels which contain chyle open in the parts of renal pellicular system. Often they open in the fornix or they may open in the pelvis, the middle part of the pelvis or front or back of the pelvis and they create a fistula which you call as pyelolymphatic fistula or lymphaticopelvic fistula. Same thing. And with the onset of fistula, the entire chyle which is accumulated in the lymphatic system is pushed into the renal system and then it flows down to appear from uretic orifice into the bladder and outwards into the urine. Now these dilated incompetent retroperitoneal lymphatics are universally seen in all patients of chyluria. There are two theories for this. Some people say there is an obstruction in the lymphatic, that is why these lymphatic vessels become dilated and draw tumors. Some people say it's a regurgitation. There are probably both factors play a role here. I have seen that the chyluria is more common from the left kidney. I would say that up to the tune of 60-70% of times, it's more common on the left side. And uh, why it is so? Why it is mostly on the left? We have not been able to find any answer to this. but. My feeling is that there are some variations in the lymphatic anatomy and collaterals between right and the left. People sleep in the left lateral posture more often than not. So the, by the virtue of dependency, you have more lymphatic stagnation on the left side. And once the lymphatic rupture on one side, the, the pressure of the lymphatic is released in the renal collecting system. There is no need to have either fistulous communication on the right side. So that's why left side patients present more often to us. So this is about what is chyluria and what is the pathogenesis of this disease. I'll continue my talk on chyluria in the part two lecture where I talk to you about how does chronic chyluria influence the patient. So thank you very much for being with me. In case you have any questions or comments, please write on my email. Thank you.